<laughs> you mentioned preaching failures. Uh, I'm sure every preacher has had had those. What what do you suggest we do with our preaching failures? <laughs> so many of them. Uh, How should we look at them? <clears throat> at one, they're inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just humans. I mean, Bart's right. It's an inability. <laughs> even the even the best sermons. I've had sermons before, and people have come out and they've said, uh, you know, "Boy, you're so eloquent. You're a really good speaker." And that could be a failed sermon mm -hmm. because the attention is mm -hmm. about me and how well he Delivery. speaks. He's so snappy with words. So that can be a wall between people and God. Um, everybody's had the experience of a sermon that you feel didn't go so well, but it really spoke to somebody. God mm. used it somehow, and God probably used it because of its flawedness. Because mm. we're speaking to flawed people, we are flawed people. There are some portions of Scripture that are tougher than others, uh, or that we may not like to deal with. How do you find beauty in, in some of those? <laughs> I think you mentioned the Transfiguration story. Oh my God. The Transfiguration story, that's gotta be one of the uh, beautiful stories. Mm -hmm. What to say about it, it alludes <laughs> I said in my lecture, I said, I've heard all kinds of sermons on the Transfiguration, I hadn't cared for any of them. Just, I don't know what they are. And I was just struck in preparing for this talk that at least in Matthew's version, the disciples saw the Transfiguration and it says, and they fell on they fell on their face in awe. Mm. Like they, they didn't have, there wasn't a point, there wasn't a takeaway, mm. there wasn't a mission project that issued from it. Um, that sort of thing. Texts just uh, uh, vary. Um, Susan Sparks a little while ago was kind of doing her humor in the Bible mm -hmm. shtick, and she did the hilarious thing about the the Philistines that steal the ark and they wind up with uh, hemorrhoids. Yeah. Now, that's not beautiful, but it's <laughs> but it's fascinating. A lot of art. Mm -hmm. If you go to an art museum, there's a lot of art that's it's a body mm -hmm. in nature, and there's an allure to that. It's it's revealing something uh, that's lovely in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm big on. I, I don't. I was taught uh, to stay within the text of the day. Don't be. Mm -hmm forward or backward within the book. Mm -hmm. Don't veer into other books. You stay in that pericope. Uh, and I tried that for a few years, and I don't really do that too much now. And I have good warrant, because Augustine, Luther, mm -hmm. Wesley, great preachers have <laughs> gone all over the Bible. Uh, so I like to think of a given text as you know a brush stroke within mm -hmm. this larger painting mm -hmm. of the Bible. So you may read something, and it's, it's a little prickly, but it's mm -hmm. part of something that's larger. And so you step back. And appreciate that part of it, but it's a part of that larger whole that is this immense beauty that is the kingdom of God. You also mentioned that every message should address the body as the body. God has plans for you, plural. Hmm. Say, say more about that. The, uh, I listen to a lot of sermons. I don't hear that many mm -hmm. that are addressed to the church as it the church. It becomes so individualistic. It's, each sermon is you and you and you and each individual is supposed to go do something. Um, so I try in every sermon to have something that's directed toward the body, and it may be the body of Christ at large, but more specifically, I think about the body that's in front of me. What kind of church are we going to be? What is God calling us to do? Um, and I find that that resolves some um, homiletical tangles that you can get into, mm -hmm. like the wheat and the tares. I mean, that's a good example. Uh, if, if it's an individualistic sermon, then you're saying, are you wheat or are you tares? Are you some mix of wheat and tares? I don't know what to do with that. But if it's a sermon to the body, that were, that's, I think that's how it was mm -hmm. intended. They're wheat and tares. And we let them grow together. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you, you can calm down over some issues that you didn't know how to resolve. Uh, and at the end of the day, you want people to find their location within the body of Christ, not become autonomous followers of Jesus. So to elicit that in a sermon seems lovely and appropriate. And at the end of the day, we want people to come together to go be the people of God. This is a, a big question, but what gives you hope about the art of preaching in the 21st century? I hear uh, a 
lot of really good young preachers. And there's an ability now. Uh, like I said, I, uh, I heard from a guy who, um, he downloads my sermons every mm-hmm. week. I think, oh my goodness. Uh, there's an ability now to access good preaching mm-hmm. in a way. When I started, I remember once in a while you could get a cassette tape of somebody, right. maybe, to hear. But now you can go in a lot of places, and you not only hear, you can see somebody, which I think is every bit as important as hearing them. You know, what do they do with, the, with their hands? How are they presenting what they're doing? So I think that's a place where technology really helps us. We focus too much on how does technology help us in terms of kind of bells and whistles during a worship service, or I'll pause during my sermon and there'll be something, uh, which is fine. Um, but you be able to look at people who are good at this craft and learn from it. I don't know. I think that, 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 that that's a very practical thing, but I think it's very hopeful. I like the idea of being in, a lot of people have said this, but I like it, being in postmodernism where... You know, being a Christian isn't the same thing as being a citizen of the United States or having a pulse. It's a, it's a serious decision that you've got to make. I like to preach in that kind of culture, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to the sort of the ennui, the boredom of preaching to people that it's their club and they've always been in that club and it's what mom and daddy did. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's hopeful in a way. Thanks for talking with us, James. Glad. It's always a pleasure. <laughs>